what role do you think kettlebells play in supporting whole body vitality, muscle strength, fat loss? Why should people be should people consider using kettlebells as a part of their workout? Um, Because it really helps you, like, you step out of your comfort zone. Like, a lot of times, like, I mean, for for a while now, like, machines and, like, barbells have been, like, the front fold of, like, fitness. And it's because it's been proven, like, this is what can get you big, this can get you results. But also a lot of aches and pains come with it. A lot of just beating down, just constantly lifting heavy. The kettlebell really kind of pull you away from it and really helps you focus on the movement of your body instead of like the movement of like the equipment that you're using. Mm. So when you're focusing more on about what your body can do and your body's ability, that's like more for like the longevity perspective of like fitness. Interesting, but it's like a lot more technical, isn't it? I mean, very more technical. It's just cause it's not just strength. You have to, you have to be mobile. You have to be stable. Like a lot more is required from you than just sitting in a machine and just like pressing your legs out or doing a barbell press like your body has to be able to be able to be capable of more hmm. so you get more out of it interesting yeah i'm the i'm the latter i'm more of like the barbell like yeah you know but um but i definitely see value to you know doing like functional movements and focusing on mobility and stuff like that which is what why one of the re- one of the many reasons why i gain a lot of value from your content mm-hmm. how do you get into this like what's your background oh uh, i was so i played football i played football majority of my life college football body was just banged up like the way you train the way you prepare for different these sports and you take a, you just take a beating and you combine that with like the traditional weight lifting of like the bodybuilding style like i was just in pain so i tried to like i was like how can i really approach this in a way where i can still get strength and still have gains but be able to like do this forever like the way i was training as a bodybuilder and doing all that stuff i couldn't do that forever at some point you get hurt at some point you just get sick of it and you stop and you lose all the progress that you gain it's just it's just everything goes to shit so i was like let me find a way i can train and like be able to do this for long term hmm. not lose strength not lose any muscle but gain mobility gain stability gain control of just all movement wow yeah. had you had had injuries i know you had you had, yeah. you had some ankle stuff right ankles knees like shoulders anything that involves like body i just had pains just beaten up yeah damn were you always an athlete always yeah track i played basketball when i was younger damn football always was just very active but never from an understanding of how to like take care of my body i was just like just go just full go never slowing down never stretching never doing anything just full go hmm because i mean do they i'm the furthest you can well i mean i guess like i'm a I'm an athlete in the sense that I love fitness, but mm-hmm. I've never been an athlete. Like I'm, you know, so I'm curious, like, do they teach you about like proper diet, nutrition, recovery, like the value of all those things? Like when you're training? In my era, no. I feel like maybe they may do it a little now, but not really. It's about like, we need you to perform. We're going to practice. We're going to play in the game. It's a little bit of like weight training, like depending on what level you're in, like some bigger colleges, they have like, I don't know if they have like nutritionists on staff. They just make sure you're eating enough. They don't really care about what you're eating. They just need to make sure you're fueling to be able to perform. I don't think it's on the lines of, like, the type of food and all that yet. I don't think so. And this is, like, when you're in college, right? In college, yeah. So you're just, like, you're also, like, doing the thing that, like, college kids do, right? You're, like, partying. No, so actually I didn't. Like, I was – I think I saved myself from that perspective. I was never really into the partying. Or anything like the whole time I was in college, I may have drank probably like three or four times. Really? Wow. Yeah, because they the way they construct our schedule, like you had to really put effort into it if you wanted to like party. Because we had practices on Sundays, it was like between like the downtime, it wasn't working to me. It was like go to practice, hungover. It was like no, nah, I'm not gonna do that. Interesting. Mm. How do you find the balance between like school, like you know, and all the obligations of the student? Oh, there's there was none. I I flirt with the idea now. I'm like. I wonder if I would like have my kids or if I could do it again, would I play college sports? Cause up until my senior year, I felt like I had no control over my schedule, my life, everything was controlled by the sport I was playing. Hmm. Interesting. Where'd you go? Went to Merrimack. Damn, nice. Yeah, I went to uh, <laughs> University of Miami, which is like a big college mm-hmm. football school, but I've never been like, I don't follow sports. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, it was always funny to me because the school gets this the like the student body is so passionate. Yeah, big time you know? down there. Although Miami's kind of like 
there's this duality, I guess, to the student body where like, you know, the, the American kids are super into football and, and other sports, but then there's a lot of international students at University of Miami. And so there's, you know, there is a big, I did find my people down there okay which tended to be European, South Americans that weren't super into sports. Did you either. play like any, any murals or anything? No, I didn't play anything, man. I was, uh, like when I was in high school, I discovered weightlifting mm-hmm. and I was really interested. I was really interested in, um, in bodybuilding just from the, from a science perspective. Yeah. And also like, I was like an introvert shy kid. And so, you know, weightlifting is a really seductive, like as yeah. a, as a high school student, you, you know? get into it and you get to see the muscles and all that. Everything that comes from it is like, all right, this is great. Yeah. How long have you been in LA? I've uh, been a few days now. Uh, nice. Been good. I like it. I like the weather this morning. It reminded me of Boston a little bit. The rain and all that stuff. That's cool. Yeah. And I see you've been hitting the steakhouses. <laughs> yeah, big time. I went to some gym. It was what is it like John Perry or something like that? I don't know. Yeah, it's a gym that was in um, Santa Monica. I think. Nice. I thought I saw you at Gold's. No, I'm not. No, you didn't. You didn't get to, to go to Golds. You gotta oh, go to Golds. I, it's always too crowded for me. Like I, when I came here last time, it was too crowded. Dude, Schwarzenegger's there all the time. <laughs> he actually works out at. So there was. He goes to like the sauna place across the street from where I was at earlier. Oh uh, shit! Really? Cross paths. Yeah. That's. Co- oh, you cross paths with him? You saw cross him? Cross paths. We saw him. Yeah. Oh, amazing! <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get him on the show. I lo- I'm a big Schwarzenegger fan. Does he do a lot of different podcasts? I haven't seen him. He doesn't do that many, but he recently. You know, he's the GOAT. He came out with a book <coughs> recently, and um, he's he's out there. I mean, I'm yeah. friends with his, one of his sons. And, and he's around. So He's around, yeah. 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 That would be good. I, I mean, made, yeah. just picking his brain on just, like, different stuff, that will be, like, GOAT. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's just, like, one of the legends in the field of, in the sport of bodybuilding, mm-hmm. which um, I've never had the genetics for it, but I've just always admired. I mean, that's cute. I like when people say that. What do you What do you mean by like the genetic piece of it? Well, I mean, I've been working out my whole life, and obviously, I didn't know as much about you know hyper the science around like hypertrophy and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Um, as much as I do now, over the you know since I began working out, but you know I've still been putting in I think pretty significant effort for most of my life, and this is how I look, you know. Yeah. Like, I'm proud of my physique, but because I'm always curious, I always think of two people like that. It's they like when they say that, I'm like, I'm always curious. I would like, I wonder what I could do with someone else's like physique, their genetics. If I had my same discipline, my same knowledge, and I applied it, I wonder what I'll be able to get out of it. I'm curious. You got good genes, though. I see people all the time. They sh- always say that. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I don't know how that works. I like, I look at my family members. I'm like, I don't think if you saw them, you would say that. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe so you got like, lucky. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I got lucky. Or it's a flip. Or I'm actually doing something. You know what I mean? And yeah. actually working hard. So from a dietary standpoint, you obviously I mean I love your I love your approach. I don't I don't know too much about your dietary philosophy. I'd love for you to like unpack it. Well, I I try to do um and that that gets into like the drinking thing as well, why I never got into it. It's just like Longevity standpoint, I never saw like what it would do for me. Like I felt like it would like really tear on me if I like mix that into what I do as far as eating and all that. So it was like there was just no room for it. But I try to stick with whole foods, like same approach that you like to do. Try to give my body what it needs to be able to perform. With when I mean like exercises and like running and doing stuff like that. And I try to look at it from that standpoint instead of like just eating. Like I kind of treat it like fuel, because in a sense it really is like. If you want to operate, be focused, be energetic, you got to give your body what it needs to operate. Yeah, totally. Within like Whole Foods, though, I see you do you do it. You're a big like red meat. Fan. Red meat, yeah. red meat. Um, I'll do chicken sometimes, but I do fruit, vegetables. I do carbs, but like when I feel like I need them, like if I'm I have a week where I'm like doing a lot of running, I'll make sure I have rice, I'll have oatmeal, I'll do things like that. But like, I'll. Oddly enough, my body operates pretty well with like without a lot of ton of carbs. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm similar, but I've definitely been integrating a bit more starches in the form of like oats and yeah, you know, rice and I've always been a big fruit consumer, but um but yeah, you know, I think like people have it wrong about carbs. You know, people tend yeah. to think that carbs make you fat. No, they don't. Yeah. You just got to pay attention. So I like, I really, I'm very mindful of how, 
like my body feels when I do eat certain things. I like try to pay attention to like how my body responds if I eat a lot of this or a little bit of that. So I mean, you really pay attention to these things. You can kind of see what like works well for you because some people like it may not be good for them. I mean, just because eating carbs may push them to eat some carbs that are not that great, and then they binge and it takes them down a path of like eating insane amount and that's what i um I, I wanted to ask you that too i was like when it comes to like the carnivore diet and those types of diet do you think <clears throat> they work well for people because they're getting rid of the shitty carbs they're eating or is it just how good the red meat is for their body yeah it's a good question i mean i think it's both you know i'm not like a i wouldn't consider myself a carnivore dieter i always say that i'm like carnivore adjacent in the mm -hmm. sense that i think it's really important that people embrace the value of animal source foods. And mm -hmm. I think red meat in particular is is highly nutrient dense, but yeah, people that adopt the carnivore or any diet, any dietary pattern mm -hmm. for that matter, it's like, there's no dietary, there's no diet that I'm aware of that, that encourages more ultra processed foods, you mm -hmm. know? So like, regardless of what, what diet I think somebody picks, people tend to do well on it, at least in the short term because usually, I mean, most, most dietary recommendations are like reduce the ultra processed foods. And then a carnivore diet in particular, I think can benefit people because it's a higher protein diet naturally. Mm -hmm. And protein is super satiating. I think it's a very nutrient dense diet. I, it's not without its shortcomings in my, in my point of view, I think like, you know, I think dietary fiber is important. I think there's lots of good to be gained from plant source foods like the various phytochemicals and minerals and vitamins and stuff but um but yeah it's a diet that's that's palatable but it's not hyper palatable it's very satiating it's very nutrient dense and for people with gut issues i think it's a very well tolerated diet mm -hmm. so that's it i mean in a nutshell it's not magic yeah i mean i've i've gone down that rabbit hole for a little while and i feel like it works well for me like i'm i told you like i don't feel like i need a ton of carbs for my body to like function properly yeah so i don't know it's something i like to flirt with but like i tell people a while like they, they try to like like meet red meat the enemy and i'm like oh man i just don't think that's the case dude there's like a war against red meat it's like crazy i, I don't and i don't understand it i really don't i really don't understand the idea of how can you be okay with I mean there's chicken that have higher fat sources as well like dark meat chicken is similar so like why nobody says anything about that yeah nobody's that and not to mention we've been eating red meat since we've been for as long as we've been human mm -hmm. so yeah I just think it's absurd but do you coach people on nutrition so I I do and I don't it's like like Ideally, you're supposed to have like certain certification. I have like precision nutrition, like so I can give guidance, but I try to like stay out of like writing diets for people. I try because most people won't follow them. They like it's just so I try to give people like tips and like guidance on how to like eat what their body needs. So like I'll tell them we'll start the training plan. We'll get into like a routine of doing doing different exercises for a certain amount of weeks, and I'm like. What do you feel like? Like, does your body feel like it needs more food, more this, more that? And then kind of try to put more food like that they need as far as like carbs, or protein to make them be better and feel better to be able to perform doing these exercises. Yeah. So when you put it into that realm of things, they'll start to look at the bad food as like, oh, maybe this won't help me be able to work out or to recover better from what I'm doing because mm. it just doesn't make sense. So you start to eliminate things that don't really help you grow or gain strength throughout it process of it. So it's like, all right. Yeah, that makes sense. How do you, how do you motivate your clients to actually adhere to your recommendations? Because I feel like there's a big thing in the wellness world now where you know everybody's like seemingly promoting a different prescription for health. The information's out there, mm -hmm. but still adherence to healthy habits mm -hmm. tends to be pretty low. Like the drop off rate is, is super high. You just know? gotta make it seem like it's approachable, man. You just gotta make it seem simple. And a lot of times it is simple. Just add more protein here, eat one more meal here, there, try to get more sleep, 
just start exercising consistently. Like a lot of people, like the lot of my issue with like the bodybuilding type of programs and stuff like that, like it works well for people that loves to work out and we know the benefits of it. But for somebody that don't train a lot and they don't actually enjoy working out, if you give them a workout that they may see as boring, they're not gonna do it. Hmm. You're not gonna be able to consistently get them to show up and be excited about working out enough to get results from it. So what I do, I try to take an approach where I can get them to enjoy what they're doing to want to show up and to get the benefit from it. If you go through a workout and you feel good afterwards, you want to do it often, even if it's 30 or 40 minutes. And if that's something you start to love, you're going to make sure you can do it so you're going to start to feel properly and be able to get through it. So it's kind of like a little bit of manipulation, I guess, but like it works because they fall in love with the exercise and now they want to make sure they can do everything to keep doing it that way so they can be healthy. Yeah. Mm. You got to use whatever works. Whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. And a lot of times it's not those like strict and like regiment programs that we grew up doing because that's just what's out there. But those people, it's not going to work for them. Yeah. It's so true. It's a big, it is a big concern, you know, because the yeah. information's out there. The information's out there more than it's ever been. Yeah. But yet population statistics are just like getting worse and worse. People get afraid. It's like it's like too much information is like paralyzing. Like mm. there's a lot out there, but like how do I know what is for me? Because a lot of information that benefits some people, but other people, is, it wouldn't be helpful at all. So you just gotta find. That's why I love the internet as much as I hate some like the negative stuff. You could you gotta find the audience you fall in, mm. like the content that's for you. Like I like on my feed, I see dog stuff all the time because that stuff normally makes me smile, and makes me happy. But it's like that works for me. Some people don't want to see that. I see f different food stuff that appeal to my like angle of how I eat. So it, I take knowledge from that. But you just gotta find what works for you. Yeah, it's so true. The the internet, it's like social media is such a double edged sword. Mm. How do you like? Do you do you get criticism all the time? You do <laughs> all the time. I try to fight it with like logic. Be honest. It's like I don't get offended. Like I understand that's your perspective. Like you only can think as far as you know. So I'll give you a little bit of insight on what I know to see if you understand. It. If you don't, okay, whatever. It is what it is. I hate critics. <laughs> I like it in a way. Sometimes they point out stuff that you may not have noticed or may not be aware of, and it's actually helpful. So you may take it as motivation, but sometimes it's just nonsense. I really find out, I think the internet has really exposed like how idiotic people really is. Oh, 100%, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't take criticism from somebody that you wouldn't take advice from. Oh, big time. And the vast majority of commenters on social media, like I would just, you would not take life advice from. You probably wouldn't even talk to them. <laughs> you wouldn't even talk to them. They don't have much to say or much to offer. Like the people that bash me about like, oh, you're on steroids, and they're like, they seem so sure. I was like, how can you be so wrong about something you have no idea about? I was like, think about this. If you actually followed me, you would know, like, I'm very anal about what I put in my body. I won't drink alcohol. There's certain foods I won't touch. You think I'm gonna take steroids? Like, where's the logic in that? Like, mm -hmm. that makes zero sense. So it's like, if you actually think about it, like, it wouldn't make sense that I would be. So why would you con consider that to be an option? Yeah. You don't take steroids. You are, do you mess with supp supplements? You take creatine. You take like no, no, no. no. Wow, no. interesting. I eat. I eat food. I try to get as much as I can out of food. Like I'll have vitamins where I'll magnesium more. But my problem is I'm not consistent. Like I will never be consistent enough with that stuff. Like so, like protein powder. Protein powder like hurts my stomach. Interesting. So like I can't really do anything that I can't do consistently. I know I can eat food consistently. Hmm. So I'm like. And I try to push my clients to that. It's like, it's fine if you can find a supplement that you can enjoy, but like, how long are you actually gonna be into that supplement before you stop buying it or you fall off? And now you no longer getting the benefits that it was giving you. Hmm. But the food, you gotta eat every day. Exactly. <laughs> you have to. Interesting. Yeah, it's so true. I'm not like a big supplement guy, but, um, but yeah, I take creatine. I take a handful. I take magnesium as like one of my staples. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I'm traveling, I take, you know, I tend to bring stuff with me just to make sure that I'm checking my, checking my nutritional boxes. But yeah, I mean, like the real gains are like supplements can add, you know, food can take you 95% mm -hmm. of the way there. For sure. You know, like creatine might offer like a 5% benefit 
it's not magic. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe there's like a 5% benefit to be gained from creatine, I think. It's like r- around there. But um, but yeah, food will take you 95% of the way there. No question. Big time. And for most people, that's all they really need. It's like why you, you get, they get so hyper-focused on like hacks and like different stuff that kind of like make up for what they're lacking in nutrition and like exercise. If you just start to implement a little bit of more better nutrition and a little more exercise, all that stuff would be irrelevant. Hmm. How do you convince, like, you know, if a client comes to you and they've never stepped foot into a gym, they've never held a kettlebell, like, what's your approach then? Um, I do with like what I do with my parents. Like, I, it's hard for me to get them to approach like the gym thing. So, I'm, start walking. You gotta get your body used to being under like stress that it's not used to. And sometimes for people that don't walk, that's enough. Walk two or three miles. Like, my parents came to Boston like two years ago. And they never been in like a city like that type of area. So we, I walk everywhere. They were like sore from just walking because they don't do it that often. They don't exercise to a point where they are physically like able. So like we probably walked three or four miles, legs and everything was hurting on them. So like sometimes it's just simple as just start walking. So true. You live in Boston? Yeah, I do live in Boston. Nice, it's a beautiful city. I love it. Yeah, how long have you lived there? Uh, it's been. In, in the heart of the city, it's been like seven years now. That's awesome. Yeah. The winters I couldn't deal with, but. That's the best part. Is it? There's less people around. Everybody stays inside. That's fair. That's fair. What would you say are some other big misconceptions that people have about um, about nutrition? Mm-hmm. We'll go back to like fitness and like, and, you know, mobility and stuff. But like with regard to nutrition, there's a lot of, I guess, misinformation out there or, or, or misconceptions, I think, about what it means to eat healthy today. Um, but for the same, like people, like a lot of times when people see me, they think, oh, you must not enjoy what you eat because you're lean, you're, you're muscular. It's like, it's not true. Like everything I eat, I enjoy. And like, it's just, I have an understanding of how much my body needs for me to be able to look my best, feel my best, perform my best. It's just, people think it's a lot more complicated than it is. It's not. It's like, you can have a balanced diet of eating things you want to eat. And still be happy. And your body operate operates at its best when you're eating what you're supposed to be eating. Hmm. That's why detox or they got so popular. It was like you're not. It's not that you're like you're doing like a hack or something. You just remove the, all the BS that you put in your body, and your body's operating freely as it should be all the time because you don't have this nonsense in your body. True. That. <laughs> are you are you like? Do you tend to be calorie focused, macro focused? Yes and no. Like I, I make sure I get enough protein. I make sure like I, I'm very mindful of like I know enough to know I'm eating around this many calories. Like I'm not overeating. Like I pay attention to it in that aspect. Of, yeah. Yeah. Just like mind, just general like mindfulness. Yeah. Around. Mindfulness. I mean, I've done it so long. Like I counted calories before. So I have an understanding. And I think everyone should have. Like people, the moment you start talking about counting calories, people are like eating disorder. It's like no, maybe I just want to actually know what I'm putting in my body and how much does my body actually need this much food? Mm. Or am I overeating? I'm not eating enough. It's like that information is actually very valuable for your health. Mm. So you're not like attempting that at least once or twice to just have an understanding. You're missing out. You're really missing out. Yeah, it's so funny that. The mention of like calories triggers people to de- yeah. to de- to the degree that they'll claim that you have like an eating disorder or something because it it can lead to that like if you become anal about it to the point where you're hyper focused on like how much you're eating like it can lead to that for a lot of people it can lead to that because it plays but you st- I think I still would rather know. Because now I can do something about it if there needs to be changed. A lot of people, they are trying to lose weight. They don't know how much they're eating. How can you lose weight? You don't know how much you're eating. Exactly. <laughs> it's like impossible. You make it's, it's a lot harder. So what they do is they'll just try to cut down on different foods and they end up under eating like over time because they don't want to track. They go on these like crash diets. Yeah, completely like way stricter than they have to be. And it's just like not sustainable. So when they do go back to eating, they massively overeat. It's like that little understanding that you don't want to do, literally just tracking one or two days 
or a prior day. Like, just think about a day you had like a week ago. Just track that day and see what it looks like. Sometimes that's enough for people to be like, oh, wow, like that day I, I ate like nothing hmm. or I ate a lot that day. It's like just putting things into perspective. Of course, yeah. It's like just an audit, like just to, just to know. If you don't have awareness around what you're actually eating, it could be massively helpful. Big time. And not just and when you start to do it with like your health and stuff like that, you will do it with the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. With work or personal life, it's just like you start to audit all these things constantly. I do it all the time. Like I'll be like, am I really working hard or am I like, I could be doing more here. I could be doing more there. But if you get into this routine of things, it's like it's be a while before you check in and be like, all right, what's really going on? Like, because people do it all the time. They'll be like, why am I not losing weight? I've been consistently doing my diet thing for a while. And then you point out things. We're like, you haven't really exercised more than like twice in the last two weeks. You had that day where you decided you want to eat ice cream for dinner. You had this day. This day is like here, there, all these things, they just add up. I'm like, all right, now think about it. What is that like on a one of 10? You at like a four. <laughs> so why do you think you're going to lose weight? Like, it's, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Like, there has to be more effort put into, just have to be more effort. <laughs> yeah, but the, it becomes less effortful the more, you, like, awareness. Yeah. But yeah. that's the part that gets people to scare them away. They're like, I don't want to hyper-focus on this stuff. Like, what, your health? Like. You can. It's, that's like a thing. You can be. There are worse things to hyper focus <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, but like your health, I think that's something you can hyper focus on. Like that's important. Super important. Do you what? What tools have you found to be most effective in terms of just like a ge general mindfulness around what you're eating? As far as tools, it's like what? Well, I'll just like for me, you know, I think a game changer for me was about two, maybe a year and a half ago. I bought my first digital food scale okay yeah you know it was like 20 bucks on amazon and i'm not even like even today like i'm not tracking anything i'm just eating you know in accordance with like my whole my general whole mm -hmm. foods diet but i still find it incredibly valuable just to like weigh out what it is that i'm eating so i know like today i had a half a pound of um of like lean venison ground mm -hmm. venison i made like a burger for lunch two burgers for lunch and i wanted to make sure that I was hitting 50 grams of protein, mm -hmm. which is like eight ounces of the venison that I was eating. And so I used my food scale to just like weigh it out. And it also helped me meal prep and portion controls that I yeah. had eight ounces to eat tomorrow. So I want to know exactly what it is that I'm getting. If I'm making like overnight oats for myself, you know, I don't feel like I need more than a serving mm -hmm. of, it's just a good way to, you know, cause if you can eat one meal, if you can, if you can have one or maybe even two meals a day that are just like staple meals that you mm -hmm. know what's going into them, it gives you a lot more freedom for like, for example, for me for dinner where yeah. I like to go out with my family to like restaurants sometimes, you know? So it's just really, I think, effective for me, like having a digital food skill. I think it's like one of the greatest kitchen tools. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So that I have one of those, but also cooking all my meals. Mm. That'll go out sometimes as well with like girlfriend. But I cook all my meals, so I know what's exactly in everything I eat. Even when I travel, sometimes when I travel, the big thing is me is like it's going to be hard to like really control everything. So I'll eat like one or two meals, and I'll just find the best places I can find food from. But the biggest thing for me was cooking all my meals. Hmm. Like that was huge. What are the benefits of, of cooking at home more? Well, you just you control how much you use as far as like oils. Like you know what's in it. You know the quality of food you're buying. And you kind of, I mean, it's tough for people that I kind of have freedom to be able to cook every meal, but like you can meal prep as well. But yeah. it's just a convenience thing. It really is it's so much better for you. So much better for you. Because me, I'm like, I don't like being blind eyed to what my food is being cooked in. Like, I need to know all this stuff. Like, I, I like to pay attention to that. So, yeah. Is your girlfriend on the same wavelength? She's on the same way. She wasn't, but she's on the same wavelength now. She's kind of like figured it out amongst. So, She's even the same way. Like, there's certain restaurants we're like, oh, I don't want to go there. We don't really think they're probably cooking their food the best thing. Yeah. And it, like, I'm not going to go out somewhere and eat less quality of food that I would eat at home. It's like, it just doesn't make sense. And pay like four times the price. Exactly. It's like, no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm all right. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's important, like, when you're dating somebody to be on the same. Yeah. I've been the opposite before in other ways. It doesn't work. Like, somebody eat very junky and all this. I don't, it's not like I don't mind it, but it's like those habits usually flow into the rest of people's life. Like, they don't exercise, they don't do all these things. And it's just like, oh, this don't really work. Like, we're 
going two different ways right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I could date somebody who like drank like soda, like real soda, yeah. like on a regular basis or like. Yeah. I don't think I've seen anyone drink soda so long. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> We're pretty privileged. <laughs> no, it's, it's wild, man. It's just like how much of that stuff, like I'm. I don't know how much on the moderation train I'm in because I, I believe in moderation, but I think they need like alter the definition because mm. people think they can do everything in moderation. Yeah. And that's not moderation. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen this guy on social media? Eddie Ab... Eddie... Oh God, I don't know his last name. He's like a former bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he goes to the supermarket and he's like, stop eating... He's got like a Jam- Jamaican accent or something. But he's like, stop eating this shit. And he like will show like oh like the black the black guy yeah 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 he's like pretty big though on social media now he's I think I've seen now. him yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I think yeah. I've seen him I've seen him I've he seen him. Ca- he, a, a lot of people he catches a lot of shit from he people. does but people don't understand it's like if I if I do something and I share it with the world and it works for other people that's it like it's a win I'm not wrong because it worked for someone else so you can't tell me this is bad it's just too strict for you it's too disciplined for you or it's not your style that's it. It's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's not wrong. Yeah. So a lot of people give him shit because it just seems like too strict. Yeah. Like you don't want to have people thinking about looking at ingredients in a grocery store. Why wouldn't you? And why do we live in this culture now where everybody feels the need to talk shit about others when they don't, when they simply don't agree? I don't know. It's just like they want to seem appealing. Like people want to, they want to seem like you. we're one of you. Like. I'm not as strict with my food. Like I don't, you don't need to pay attention to this guy because he's too disciplined. And God forbid anyone be too disciplined. God forbid, right? <laughs> God forbid. It's wild. It's like that stuff is actually what people should strive for. Not everybody's going to reach and get there, which is fine. But you can be disciplined and get the results of from being disciplined. Yeah, and also like. I mean, I think I think it's important for people not to have food fear, but also to be able to have like a sober conversation with mm-hmm. themselves about the foods that they're eating. You know, like I eat shit sometimes, mm-hmm. ultra processed snack foods and things like that. Like, and I know it's not good for me, but that's okay. That's fine. Mm-hmm. That, I know it's not going to sway my health in any one direction. You know, one meal can't do that. Yes, right. But at the end of the day, I think it's good to be able to to be able to hold within your mind like true true. A seemingly opposing truths, you know, like that this food is maybe not the best for me, but a little bit here and there is like totally okay. It's okay, yeah. You know, but I even then, like, you start to like, w- like, bay it out, like, all right, it's okay, but like, if it's gonna make me feel sick, am I gonna eat it? So that's how I was for a while. Like, I was like, I'm, I'll eat every now and then, like, some junky food, but it got to the point where it was so little and far and few. When I do have it, I get sick, and it's like, oh, yeah. it's not worth me getting sick. So. I just started to cut stuff out completely because it was like, I don't want to get sick from it. Yeah. No, that that's definitely, <coughs> it's definitely smart, you know, because like some of these foods, they're just so hard to moderate. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's hard to, I mean, if you're the kind of person that can't have just a little bit of ice cream without mm-hmm. going overboard and eating the whole pint, then maybe you're better off not bringing it into the house at all. And, and that's where I get upset with these influences and people that talk from this perspective because what they're doing still requires discipline. Like they tell these audience, like, oh, this stuff is okay. Like I have it here and there. But that's that's a discipline still to have something once a week for an individual that's watching you that they have it every night. Yeah. So you're telling them it's okay. And it's like, but yeah, they don't exercise as much as you do. They're not, they don't know what else they're eating outside of this or how much you do. Your trainer, your nutrition, you know, whatever. You have a vast understanding of what you're doing and how you're doing it, how much you're doing. You're telling this person that has none of that information, it's fine, it's okay. It's like it's like you gotta put all of that in there and say, yeah, the quantity is oh yeah, that's their favorite. To be like, oh quantity it is but yeah, but how much of other stuff are they eating as well that's like combining and it's just a bunch of shit instead yeah. of just like a little bit of shit here and there. A hundred percent. Yeah. I definitely I agree that by you know, most I mean, most people are just like yeah, their diets are dominated by these kinds of foods. And it's like, it's unfortunate that you see so many people today essentially going to bat for the food industry, <laughs> you know, wild. like defending ultra processed food, you know, like 
food dyes and artificial, you know, colorants and, and, and flavors. And I just think it's like, yeah, you know, like that stuff. Yeah. The dose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the dose makes a poison. I get it. I get it. Right. I'm not an idiot. So yeah, of course yeah, I get it. Sure. But it's also like, does the food industry really need like an, like, like a social media lobbyist, like an advocate <laughs> advocating for more consumption of this no, kind? No, I think they got enough of that through their own marketing stuff. Exactly. But it's like, again, why? Like, what's the point? I don't get the reasoning behind being so anal about highlighting that. That stuff is not, it's about how much you're eating of it. It's not completely poisoning. When if I tell you I eat something of that and it makes me sick, and if you watch it and you see like, oh, it makes me sick too. And now you guys, people are like, yeah, but it's still not that bad. Well, it may be bad for you. <laughs> like, yeah. so you can say like, it's bad. You can give more perspective into why, but still it's okay to label something as like, it's not that great for you, to be honest. Like it's a lot of preservatives, a lot of processed BS in it. More than likely your body won't like consuming it. Totally. And I think a lot of people still today don't even make the connection between what it is that they're eating and how they feel. No, they don't. Right? Like they eat they something, no they feel like crap. They make a doctor's appointment. And then the doctor puts them on a stomach acid suppressing drug f for the rest of their lives, you know? <laughs> well, you, that's the, in the same sentence. You can't say food is healing and food is fuel and then say it doesn't matter what you eat. Wait, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Like, why wouldn't it? If it's going to heal me and it's fuel, I should pay attention to the foods that are going to give me that benefit. Yeah. And I should eat more of those and less of everything else. Yeah. How do you think... Do you, I'm curious if you have any insight on like how we can get this information out to communities that are disenfranchised and like, mm -hmm. you know, that, that aren't necessarily as tapped in to this kind of information, you know? And that's the tough part because, I mean, I think about just the, the knowledge that my parents and like peers have of food. Like they believe anything that you can buy in a grocery store, if it's edible, it's not harmful. And I mean, to a certain extent, yes, but not really. Like there's a lot of stuff that you shouldn't be consuming at any capacity, in my opinion. But they believe and they trust like if it's in the store, it's fine. Also, a lot of people that don't understand that liquid calories are a thing. Like, you can go to a restaurant and order four or five lemonades. You're at, like, 3,000 calories. Bro. You didn't even touch your meal yet. <laughs> like, all that sugar, all that. But they don't understand that the information is not, it's not loud enough. Like, it's out there, but it's not loud enough. And some people don't care. Hmm. They don't want to know. Hmm. They think we're more, like, we're cursed with information because we know this. We have to be more cautious about this. We have to think about it more. Without it, they could just live their life and just do whatever, Man, which is fine until you're like unhealthy and you're sick. And now you're trying to make those adjustments when you lived your entire life doing the opposite. Hmm. Think about it from a perspective of by the time you have full control of your diet, you have been eating what your parents have been known to the, be their truth of like health, which could have been horrible. In my case, I think it was awful. I was eating junk. But by the time I'm like 19 or 20, majority of my life, I consume all that stuff. So now I have to, now that I have the knowledge, I'm trying to, in my mind, I'm like trying to undo all of that by like being on top of what I'm putting in my body. But some people never figure it out. Hmm. So they just go their entire life and just eating unhealthy, not just unhealthy, but just not, not giving their body what it needs hmm. and then asking their body to operate. What were some of those like nutritional ideas that you had growing up? Like what are the, some of the kinds of foods that you ate growing up? I just ate what I thought looked good or like taste good. I didn't want to eat vegetables. I was eating cookies, cakes, anything that I saw as appealing, like which they were trying to make it appealing, like anything, juice, soda. Like I thought all that stuff was like fine. And I was young so I could get away with it. And I think people think that's the thing. I get annoyed with my clients now. They're like, my kids can, uh, they, they can eat this. They're young. I was like, what? Why, if you don't eat it, why would they be able to eat it? They're in the critical growing stage, and you think they should just be able to pound sugars and processed foods. That makes no sense to me, but all right. You think they can get away with it because they're young, they're resilient. All right, that's fine, but we don't really have the data to see what that looks like over time for kids when they eat one way versus another. Yeah. Just, we don't have enough information to kind of 
talk about that, but I I do believe it plays a role in like childhood obesity for kids. And like your parents, like where did your parents get their nutrition information from? Like nowhere, yeah. just like wherever their parents. Like you, it's the same thing. I have the idea with like um, financial literacy. Like if you grow up in a house that talks about wealth and schools don't teach it, so if your parents teach you about money, then you're lucky. But if you grew up in poverty, you only learn what your parents learn, and mm-hmm. they only taught you what their parents taught them. So you're never going to get the information to have a better idea how to handle money, how to spend, how to save, how to invest. You'll never learn it because schools don't teach it. So you continue to have that chain of poverty for your family and the family after that, unless somebody breaks that chain and like gain that knowledge and understanding of how. It's Hmm. the same thing with food. Interesting. It's the same. So if somebody's listening to this, watching this, that is still in poverty, like what are some simple things you think? like some low hanging fruit, you know, for somebody who's like still stuck in poverty, but wants to eat better. Um, it's, it's, but that's, 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 that's what I believe is the issue. It still requires work. Like you got to find places that have affordable foods that can still be healthy, like farmers markets, places like that, that makes those cause call a spade a spade to eat healthier. It costs a lot more money. So if you don't do the groundwork to find these deals or cheaper foods, like you're just gonna be like, I'm gonna grab the cheap unhealthy stuff because that's what it is. Hmm. What are some cheap protein sources? I mean, like protein's so important, right? Like just like that's, increasing protein. That's tough because it's like chicken breast costs more than like a chicken thigh or a chicken wing. It's like, how do you really do it? Like it's unless you go the process route, which is like the frozen, to do that stuff. But at that point, are you getting the same type of protein or the same? Is it doing for you the same way it's doing for like a uh, chicken breast versus like a uh, frozen chicken tenders? Is that the same type of protein? I don't think so. Mm. So it's like it's hard. It's like you really have to do the groundwork, try to find local farms. Like it requires work, and most people don't want to do that. Most people want the easy way out. Yeah, you just I grab this. It's cheaper. It's chicken. It says it's chicken. I don't really know if it's chicken, but it says chicken, and we have it for dinner. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I couldn't believe the the pushback that I got. I posted a video a couple months ago where I was speaking at like a college, and one of the students, you know, students are typically broke, right? Yeah, yeah. I was a student once. I was broke, and some student told me that. I had no idea. You could go to any McDonald's and you can order. There's an there's a secret a la carte menu where you can go to any McDonald's and you can order just a pound of beef or like a, a quarter pounder patty. Mm-hmm. And so you can order four quarter pounder patties, which are, you know, I guess prior to cooking, a pa- that's a pound of meat. Yeah. And it's like eight bucks. You can get four quarter pounder beef patties mm-hmm. in a tray from any McDonald's by ordering them a la carte. And it's like a pound of beef. For like eight dollars, I didn't know like that. that. I didn't know. Yeah, that. it's crazy. Yeah, but I so I, I did a video where you know I went through a McDonald's drive-through. I haven't eaten McDonald's, bro, in like twenty five years, <laughs> See. if not longer, thirty years. And um, and I did this video, and I was like super psyched to like share that, put this information out into the world, and it you know it got a ton of views, and a lot mm-hmm. of people were super supportive, as they I think should be that I shared this kind of information on a public platform, but. A lot of people were like, why are you, you know, supporting McDonald's and like, this is, you know, this is disgusting. Like you're supporting the factory farms. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm actually like providing a way for people yeah. that, you know, maybe they live in a town where the only restaurant is a McDonald's. Yeah. And, and it's a way to get 80 something grams of protein for $8. For sure. There needs to be more ways to reach people that can't just buy the most expensive groceries it's easy for like I, I and i think it's different when i have those clients that money's not an issue and i'm like you need to eat we need to try to eat this this and this and i grab this 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 no problem but you talk about people that have to pay more attention to what they spend and how they spend it on food and they have a certain budget on it you got to be like you got more knowledge you got to be more creative and you got to figure out ways to get so you got to know more yeah, yeah. well I mean, you're obviously super successful, but if you say tomorrow, you, for whatever reason, self-imposed, you self-imposed a budget, like a, mm-hmm. a small budget on yourself. Like what are the kinds of things that you would buy? Cause you have all this knowledge, right? Yeah. I would still get like the beef. I would still get eggs. I would still get all these things. Would you may, buy them? may not if... be the best quality of things, but I would still be able to get those things. Hmm. Like I wouldn't buy, I still wouldn't buy processed foods. I, I just wouldn't. Yeah. 
And it's like no point. Well, because you're like spending money on yeah. stuff you shouldn't. Yeah, exactly. it's like save that money, put that toward the beef. Yep, rice or whatever. You yep. know. I mean, there's there's cheaper options everywhere. There's cheaper grocery stores. Like I had this, um, and this this sounds pretty bad. So I I love eating red meat, but I like eating make sure the quality is there for me. Like I like to eat a ton, so like I want grass fed and I want to do all this. And I was talking to my girlfriend. About it. I was like. If I couldn't get the type, now I'm at the position, if I couldn't get the kind of bread meat I want, I don't think I'll eat it. Interesting. Like, if I could had to go to a certain grocery store or somewhere that they just sell what they sell, and I've seen, I compare quality in a lot of different these things, I wouldn't eat it. Interesting. Like, I think it matters that much to a certain extent for, like, some people, like, the quality matters. Like, some people are vegan because they believe, like, some of the meats are just like not healthy the way they're consumed the factories like the way they process things and this is just like regular chicken breasts or regular they just think it's like not healthy and some of them i i agree if you can get a better quality go for it most of the time that's the best option but like i said with the red meat thing i think i don't know if i would eat it if i couldn't if I didn't know where it was coming from source wise like i i get my beef source from piedmont tea so great beef so i know where it's coming from if i couldn't i don't know yeah i mean i guess i have like a, a somewhat different perspective in that like i think if you couldn't afford the most pristine beef you know i think like i would go to a costco or something i don't even know i mean yeah. i'm assuming that there's costco's all over the country but i would buy whatever whatever it is that they have what? but i would i would reach for like leaner versions mm -hmm. you know because i think what a cow eats largely influences like it's fat and you know toxins are stored in the fat so who knows what you know these industrially farmed cows are eating so i would just get like leaner leaner meat. leaner leaner meat yeah that makes sense that's why people shoot for the chicken breasts rather than yeah i mean it, i think that's an option as well especially for people that can't afford to source and like pay that type of price or you could buy cheaper cuts <coughs> like cheaper, che cut. cheaper cuts are typically really um tough and that's why people don't like them mm -hmm. but you can just slow cook them like with a little patience yeah and know how and i think also like a lot of people are like big into like cleaning their meats as well i've seen a lot of what people mean by that? like um like chicken they'll like they clean it like lemon vinegar like they'll go through a whole cleaning process that's like crazy to me <laughs> i mean i don't understand necessarily why but they do it they say it helps i guess i don't know interesting i think that's actually like i think they recommend not to do that because it's like it increases the chances that you know if you're if you've got like raw chicken and water on it and you put it in the sink it's like the potential for potential bacteria for that, yeah. can get everywhere you know as opposed to just like taking it taking it yeah yeah there's people that do that wow fascinating i was reading a statistic recently that kind of blew my mind that because you know like 60 percent of the calories your average american consumes today comes from these like ultra processed foods like boxed packaged bagged foods but for black Americans, it's like 70 to, it could be 70 to 80%. Yeah. And it was so like upsetting to me when I read that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do we, you know, what can we do? It's, it's like, a, it's a cultural thing is a knowledge barrier. And just the, again, like the lack of understanding. Like I'm not, I'm not necessarily reaching <clears throat> that cohort, but like, I'm super, super happy that leaders such as yourself you know oh, have, the, have the potential to big time it's just you know? is understanding the perspective of it and why they don't see it that way it's hard to reach that audience if you never like really been in those shoes and like understand why like i told you i grew up eating all this stuff because again my parents bought what they could afford and on an average night like we 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 had we had dinner we had chicken we had all this stuff we had all that stuff but we also had a lot of processed stuff because it's easier to cook Timing wise, even put together microwave stuff, like it was just convenience. Convenience, costs, and knowledge is like that's like the food barrier in our community. Yeah. When you drive through the country, you see that there really are that that distribution is a really big big time. Nobody should be starving. We live in a time, I mean, it's like the first time in human history where there are more overweight people walking the earth than underweight. Like yeah. and we've got such a, a massive obesity problem in this country. So it's not, you know, it, we don't have a shortage of calories, no. right? But it's like the distribution of nutritious food, I think, still 
lacks you know yeah. like there is like the big question of food equity that i think is like a huge problem but that's the thing is like understanding what your body needs like people don't think about life as like a performance in a world like i need to be like i shouldn't be tired all the time i shouldn't be in pain all the time i should be more alert i should be able to walk up a flight of stairs without getting tired like i should be able to do all this stuff and because i can't it's like i maybe should do something about it and try to figure out why and then that's when you'll start to get in the roots of exercise and like food and do all this stuff. But people never really ask themselves those questions. Hmm. They just deal with their pains. Like I've always had this pain. Like it's been never an issue. And that was that was my explorer kind of I went on with fitness. It was like I shouldn't you shouldn't always have that pain. Like there's a reason that's there. You can kind of explore and figure out why, or you can just deal with it or work around it. You go, I'm, I'm like, I love the idea of exploring. So that's what I do with a lot of the training I do. It's just like explore more movement, explore rotation, explore, put my body in different positions and seeing the ability it gives me. And now I have like endless ability to move how I want, run, jump, lift heavy, bend, split, all this stuff. Wow. Just because I'm exploring, I just kind of put that in the same with nutrition. So like, yeah, same vegetables, I'm doing fruits, I'm doing different meats, and I'm seeing how my body responds to this stuff and like how well I feel when I eat it. And now I just want to continue to eat more of it. <laughs> yeah, I love that explorer mindset. It's yeah, so cool. it's so, so important, man. Because you always, if you just do what you know, whatever what you know is not enough or it's wrong. Yeah. How'd you first discover kettlebells? Um, I feel like I was, Working with people that were, um, I feel like, older, I guess, and they didn't want, the bar was like, not a, they were like, I'm not touching this. Hmm. Like I had some clients who were just like, I'm not doing that. Interesting. I'm not doing this. This hurts when I do that. So I had to find a way to get them to do things that were like, all right, we can just hold this bell and just like do a squat. They could, and it seems like we're getting a workout still. We're not just doing body weight, but that was the bridge, the gap to, from body weight to like exercise with like, so it could have been anything. It could have been a dumbbell. Kettlebells are more because you swing them, you can do them in that way, stability piece of it. But a lot of times it was just about getting them to understand like we still using load. Like a lot of the stuff I could have just done with them body weight, but like if you're paying $150 for a session, you don't want to go through <laughs> a full hour of a body weight session. Yeah. It's just not it. ideal. How do you achieve <clears throat> though like progressive overload with the kettlebells though? Through movement. Hmm. It's just like, like I was talking about, like the average individual can't move lateral. They can't turn. They can't do all these things. They have the mobility or the stability to be able to move in a way where it's like actually functional to life. So you have all these different movements in lateral lunges, step ups, all this stuff that you don't usually do with like barbells or machines. You're normally in fixed positions. Hmm. So you have the ability to be strong in one spot, but we're developing the ability to be strong on the go. Left, different planes. Right, different like, planes of motion. And like when you start exploring that, it's endless, especially with like unilateral movements. And a lot of these people, most people are horrible at it. So it gives them something to work at and you never run out of things to work at when you take that route. You're so right. It's like we're, we're, we focus all of our movements prim primarily. I mean, I know I do on, you know, moving forward yeah. in this like one plane, you know, pushing weight off of me, getting up off the floor, but never, yeah, the, I mean, it's never, it's it's rarely the full range of motion that yep. the human body is capable of. Yep. And you miss out on things when you don't do it. It's, it's if you put, like I can put you through a mobility session using weights, you probably sweat more than you do in your own workouts because you got, you're asking your body to, think about something and you're asking more muscle groups to be involved in it instead of just working one muscle group or two muscle groups at a time you're working your entire body and your brain and your mind is working as well hmm. you think it's helpful these movements kettlebell movements i mean there's so much content on your on your instagram but do you think they're helpful in general for like injury recovery pain mm -hmm mitigation like all that stuff yeah because it takes it takes the ego out of just lifting heavier out of things and you have to really dial back and focus on the quality of the movement hmm. so it's like there's no like there's no like wiggle room with doing it right or wrong like to be able to perform this you have to take your time and actually think about it yeah and you can't just push through it like a unilateral exercise either you got it or you don't so you have to lower the weight 
and go there. A lot of bilateral stuff, your body, you can just push through it with compensating left or right or whatever. If one side working more than the other, you can just push through it. Hmm. Most of the time, it's not great. Like, pushing through one rep is fine, but if you're constantly pushing through it, man, that's where the injuries come in at. When you're working one side at a time, you don't have to do that. Just lower the weight. Interesting. Yeah, it's – um, I mean, the stuff that you do is, like, incredible. It's – uh so empowering and it's like some of it's scary to me because i have yeah. like chronic low back issues but um which are hopefully on the men to some degree after mm-hmm. my my recent stem cell stuff but um but yeah i could see how it would be like super effective for like stabilizing the spine building it makes you dial back I'll, i i get some reviews from people sometimes it's like um like a it was an older lady she was like after going through your programming and stuff it just felt empowering like I was able to do something when I first viewed it, I thought it was impossible. Hmm. And it took me to really dial it back, really focus on the movement, really think about it and be able to build up to now I'm loading this movement. And it's like really challenged like mentally, like physically and doing everything. So that's more back into what I was talking about. When you start to exercise this way and you enjoy it, you start to make sure you can do it. Hmm. That's why this drinking thing is not for me. The, Certain foods is not for me because it's going to take away from my ability to do what I enjoy. So I just, I can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. I think like some people are maybe hesitant to try kettlebells because they associate them with like CrossFit. Yeah, because for a while that's what they were used for, like the conditioning piece of it. But I use it from like a mobility standpoint, stability. And you can really approach it like you do anything else. Like you're using dumbbells for like lunges you're using dumbbells for press it's the same thing and that's how i bridge the gap for people like we'll just start working out with it doing regular press doing rows doing we won't just jump into the swings and the cleans yet because that stuff is more advanced and you have to really learn it but you just get them start using it holding it carrying it walking around with it you get accustomed to it so now when we start swinging it you've been using it for a while now so you understand the gravity of how to hold it what it's going to do once you start to swing it and you start to realize, but it really makes you be in tune with your center of gravity and just everything about how you're moving your body. Hmm. And when you're that focused, you can really accomplish something. Do you have three favorite kettlebell exercises to share? That's a tough one. I don't know. I do like, cause it's, it's just traditional. I like doing like heel elevated squat, toe squats. I like split squats. Uh, What's the deal with heel elevated <laughs> squats? You're kind of like known for yeah, for yeah, those. Yeah. So like the, I feel like the for me there's like I feel like there's a nourishing piece of my ankles and my toes being just like exposed to a point where they have to produce strength and force with no heel. Interesting. And to be able to complete it means I have that ability to be able to do it. And if I don't, I just work at it constantly. There's like the knees over toes guy, and then there's you with like the, <laughs> the elevated <laughs> heel. <laughs> Interesting. It's good though. I mean, a lot of people have been doing it. It was like, oh, this has helped me with my knees. Like it has helped me tremendously. And it's because what you're doing is you're working more muscle groups than you wouldn't normally. A lot of people have horrible ankles, so they can't go as deep in their squat. They can't get to the point in their squat where they're actually getting the benefits from the That's squat. me. Yeah, yeah. I have like very limited squat mobility. Yeah. That's probably that's probably actually the reason why I hurt my back. Yeah. Actually. So you probably go forward. More yeah. on your squats because you can't sit. Yeah, and then I get like butt wink. Yep, super early. Yeah, but that's from that's a lot, a lot of different things. It's probably lack of lateral movement. You probably never do like cul de sac squats or lunges, lateral lunges. I don't know. It's like you're speaking Greek. To yeah. Me. <laughs> so it's just moving. Is is training your your body in a way where you the lateral outside of your knee is being worked. Hmm. So think about it from a perspective of having healthy shoulders requires you training your shoulders like 360. So every direction, you have to make sure you're strength training the same way with your knees, same way with your hips. So if you're never moving, if you're only moving this way, you're going to be really strong in these planes. But the moment your body is going to require you to use that lateral motion, it's, it's like it's not going to work. Interesting. Okay, so when squatting, try to – yeah, that's much more comfortable for yeah, me. Yeah, it's way, way more comfortable because you take out the ankle piece of it. But not just that. It's – you want to start moving loudly so your abducts are stronger. You get more glute engagement. So now when you squat, you're not just working just your quads. Hmm. Your glutes are kicking in. Everything's, everything's working. 
I mean, it's so intuitive. Like, I can't squat comfortably without my heels being elevated. Yeah. But I, I've always thought that to load that, to, to, to why to, not? I, yeah. yeah. To be strong at something is like is very beneficial, especially that. Like, I can get up almost like three sixty five with that motion. Wow. Dude, it's crazy. I have a new niece. She's like about a year and a half old mm-hmm. at this point. And one of the most fascinating observations is that when she wants to pick something <clears throat> up from the floor, she doesn't curl her spine over yeah. <laughs> to pick up. She the squats thing. down. She squats. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, babies are like the prime example for how we should be able to move as adults. People think it's like nonsense. It's like, oh, they little limbs. Like, yeah, but it's, that's how it starts. It's supposed to stay that way. You have to work to keep it that way. But we don't. We start to get in these ranges where we're only working in one plane of motion. We're sitting one way. We're just standing one way. We're never moving this way. And life happens that way. That's why I, so I tripped off of like a step the other day. And I went down into like like a kickstand squat. And I just got back up and walked off. What's a kickstand squat? It's like one heel is elevated. The other foot is just flat. Oh, interesting. So it's like half toe squat. Hmm. <clears throat> but it was so natural to me because I do it and I train it that way all the time. Anyone else probably would have tore the ACL. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just like more having the ability for your body to move freely. And that's what the kettlebells offer for a lot of different people. And that's how I like kind of promote what I do is just like take the ability away from all the machines and stuff to use. And that stuff is great. But at the end of the day, your body still needs that ability. So when you work in these machines in these fixed positions, you're not you don't have to worry about stability. You don't have to worry about balance. You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. You're just worrying on getting stronger. Hmm. All, right, all right, that's fine. But all right, when you stand up, you're not walking around in a machine. Hmm. Life is happening like on the go. You still need to be able to be stable. You still need to have balance. You have all this stuff that your body still needs that you don't get from that machine. Why are our bodies so screwed up today? Because of our routine and our life habits. It's, it's all that. I mean, what we eat, everything. It's all routine. Think about people that have like back issues and anything. You can find why in their routine. Hmm. They normally like like golfers. Like they get you constantly swinging that way. You like quarterbacks, shoulders. You constantly throwing. It's all in what you do. So if you're not training the opposite to keep it that way, keep the opposite, keep you healthy and strong, you're gonna deal with the aches and pains. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's like men go to the gym and they focus. Like it's like. They're always doing these like anterior yep. dominant, you know, to like <coughs> beef up their chests, you know, but like you all, you want to remember to strengthen and probably put even more. Yeah. Emphasis. Just as much. I mean, just as much or you, you deal with the shoulder pains, but it's, we're visual people. We work on the mirror muscles. Yeah. <laughs> like chest, arms, uh, front side of your legs, like anything you can see you work on hmm. and everything you can't see struggles. Yeah. <laughs> It's so true. Do you ever do like machines? For- so I, as of recent, I've started to put more like cable work into my stuff. Just sort of like see, see how I feel with it. Put a tonal in the house. So it's been good. But like from a standpoint, like what some of these machines offer, I can do without the machine. Hmm. Like when I squat, I can get all the benefits from the squat. So I don't need to necessarily like press, load the leg press up. Sometimes people like press or do these things because... Their squat may not look that great, and they may be squatting and not getting the true benefits from squat. Hmm. But if you have the core stability and you have the ankle stability to be able to squat to a depth where you're getting the benefits of a squat or a split squat or a lunge, then you don't really truly need to do all that stuff. Like You can build a physique, and build a body not using machines. And do you do all these like videos in your home? Is that where you film yeah, them? Yeah, my house. Yeah. yeah. So you don't even you don't even need a gym member. I go to gym sometimes. I just because if I want to be throwing bells around stuff, I can't do that in my apartment. <laughs> it's like people live underneath me. I just want to be more frugal about it and it's more intent. Like working out at home sometimes, it's, it gets annoying. It's like I'll do it later and then it doesn't happen. So sometimes I just got to be like I'm going to the gym. Hmm. But I'll still use like free weights in there as well, so I still get the same. Yeah. yeah. So what's um what's your day to day like? You you coach clients. You like so I I mean a lot of my stuff is digital now. Like a lot of my work is whatever. So I wake up, I may have like one or two people in person, but outside of that, I'm doing my own workout, hanging out with my dogs, chilling. 
And when did you get started on social media? Uh, right when COVID happened. Oh, was, really? Yeah, I was working at um, Equinox in Boston like full time at that point. So this is like social media <coughs> fame this is like fairly new. Fairly new, fairly new. Uh, like 2020. Because uh, I had, I worked at Equinox, I worked like 40, 50 hours a week. I had no time to p- record my workout. I didn't even have time to work out sometimes. So it was like, there's no time to like record and do any of that stuff. So when COVID happened, I was home. I was still doing my regular workouts. I was training some people here and there, but I had more time and I just started sharing what I was doing, what I was doing for myself. And a lot of people were like, oh, this works for me as well. Like I enjoy it. Like I, I love doing it. I'm showing up for it. Continue to put it out. So I just kept putting out, putting out, putting out. And it wasn't really draining because like I'm working out anyway. I just pull a few clips of my workout. Like I've never made it more like some people they, they got a film, they got a whole process. Like mine was raw, unedited, like this is like from my workout, I'm like dying in it. I'm not making sure the form is correct. Like I'm really going through it. So I started sharing it and people resonate when they know things are like real. Like this isn't like just scripted, like this is legit. So it got like a lot of buzz. That's awesome. Yeah. And you you work you train at Equinox? Yeah, I worked at Equinox, yeah. At uh in Boston. In Boston, yeah. Oh, so cool. Yeah. You know it's funny, I discovered your work from uh my friend Blake Ellerby, who mm-hmm. is an Equinox trainer. Okay, yeah. Here in LA. Uh. Yeah. And, um, and he was like, yo, you got to check this guy out. You guys have the same dietary philosophy. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm like, yeah. All right. Let me check this guy out. Yeah. And it's like yeah. all steak same approach, and approach. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's so cool. So what's next? You're just like continuing to, uh, to put out good content. Learning, yeah. Teaching. Definitely content. I'm probably going to be doing more like talking and speaking about stuff. Cause it's one thing. It's like, I feel like I built my brand on just action and just like what I'm doing with my body. Sometimes people want more of a deeper perspective of like how you do it and like what struggles you dealt with along the way and like how can I like maneuver from this? Like people, like I'm traveling, I've been traveling, I've been gone from Boston since last Friday. Mm. People are like, what are you even eating? How you been eating when you travel like that? Like people want to know stuff like that. So I'm gonna start sharing more along the lines of that, like a little more in depth, which is for a while. I was like, I won't do it, I won't do it. But like people want to see it. So I'm like, all right, I'll get into it yeah man <laughs> i was listening to you on our mutual friend mark bell's mm-hmm. show i think it was like a couple of years ago that you were on it and um you said that like you don't normally talk on social media no like, i don't <laughs> like you probably can find like five clips of the thousands i have with my voice on them that's so interesting yeah you got a great voice man a powerful <laughs> voice it's just more so it's like i really want it because sometimes people talk too fucking much <laughs> it's like so much so like especially in our industry the fitness industry things change all the time. So you go out there being hard, biased on something, and then you contradict yourself like six months later. And it's like, yeah, you just shut up. You wouldn't have to deal with that. <laughs> so <laughs> so I just, I'm being about just constantly just putting in work, just constantly. So now I feel like I my audience knows what I represent. They know what I'm about. So now I can like put words behind it because it's like, all right, it would make sense because that fits you. That's like who you've been showing us who you are. So now you say it, it's like, oh, of course, that would make sense. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, you do great stuff, dude. Like, uh, I'm super glad that we connected and yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. we got to record this together. And, um, yeah, people should definitely go and check out your work on Instagram. And I'm excited to see what you do next. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. No, of course. I got one last question for you. But before we get to that, um, where can people find <laughs> you on social media? Drop your uh, handles and stuff. Every goddamn Dre on YouTube. Instagram, TikTok, everywhere. And it's every goddamn drug. Yeah. <laughs> so I grew up religious. You're not supposed to use God's name in vain. So I put T instead of D. I like that. <laughs> People never understood that. I was like, yeah, I grew up. You're not supposed to like use God's name in vain in the sense of curse words. And so that makes know. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever I do, I get shit for it <laughs> <laughs> for my followers. See? But I didn't grow up religious. That's my. Uh, yeah, that's my scapegoat. Yeah. Um, cool, brother. Well, last question that gets asked everybody on the show. What does living a genius life mean to you? Um, mm, I like that question. I like it, really. I'm trying to think. Um, a genius life. I don't know, being fulfilled. Like, asking yourself the tough questions. And once you have the answers, relating them to people that may have those same questions. Like how helpful you are to yourself and other people. Yeah. 
being a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Being teachable. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Amen. Thanks for coming in. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.